Well, hello. Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? All right. You know, you guys slept in a little bit than the 9 a.m. service. Expect a little bit more. Um, how's everybody doing today, you guys? Woo! That's a little better. Thanks. Well, good morning. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, I always, uh, you, you usually find me singing some songs, but uh, I always count it a privilege and an honor to open up God's word together as a family, and uh, this is really awesome. Um, two weeks ago, uh, I know I'm going back really far, uh, two weeks ago, Pastor Mo preached the message on Ephesians 6. Uh, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, right? All of that. And he gave us uh, what's called family wisdom. And he, he charged our kids, our, our children, to obey their parents. And all the parents said, amen, amen. That was such a great word. And, uh, but he also charged us as parents uh, to raise our children up in the ways of the Lord. And he encouraged us to pray this prayer to not simply pray for our children to be good, but to pray for them to be godly. That we would raise up a godly household, godly children. And so uh, what a great privilege we have as parents to pray for our children to be godly. And then last week, Pastor Jason, uh, he continued on those principles of Ephesians 6 uh, with Gospel Parenting 101, and where he started to break down uh, different ways on how we can, as parents, uh, train up our children, equip them, teach them, discipline them through the ways of the Word of the Lord. And so today, we have one more. Everybody say one more. We got one more. Today, um, we're going to be talking about parenting one more time. This is a deeper dive into this. You could call it a box set if you'd like. Uh, nothing will be for sale, so you're going to have to find it on YouTube. Uh, but this, today, we're going to be continuing our talk in about the family, and we are going to end right where we began in Ephesians chapter 6. Um, and so today, the title of today's message is... Parenting, part three, <laughs> building blocks for a godly legacy. And we're going to be going through various passages of the Bible, but we're going to be uh, build, uh, talking about what it looks like to build a godly legacy. If you guys are ready, we're going to dive in. We have point number one. Point number one is follow the blueprint. Follow the blueprint. We're going to start with Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. And it says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Colossians 3, 16. As a kid, I used to like uh, building Lego sets. Anybody else like building Lego sets? Oh, yeah, well, yeah. That's good, that's good. Hello, builders. Good to see you. And now, um, our kids, me and my wife, our kids, as they're growing up, they like to build Lego sets as well. And I still like building Lego sets. It's been a while since I've built a set. You know, as you get older, you stop calling it Legos, and you start calling it Ikea. And so, <laughs> it's just a different form. It's just a different form, but the, but the same principles, you know? Uh, and, and so... Um, when you build Legos or Ikea, uh, you're given a set of instructions, not very detailed, lots of pictures and interpretation needs to be done with those, but pretty much all the pieces are assembled for you. You don't have to go looking for it. You got all the pieces. Everything's cut to size. You just need to assemble it, put it together. That's really, really cool. And sometimes it, it could be a little hard, but if you wanted to do something on a larger scale, let's say building a house or building a building, you also get uh, some assembly instructions, except they're called blueprints. And they are uh, not just little pictures, they are detailed. Blueprints are detailed. They show the dimensions, the measurements, and the outcome, the design of what it is that build project is. And blueprints are very, very important. If you were working on a construction crew, um, 
This allows all of the different trades that are working on that build project to work towards the same end. If you ever went to a construction site, somewhere on that site, the blueprints would be accessible. If you were one of those builders and as you're building, something seems a little off, you would refer to the blueprints. If you were a couple of builders and you start arguing on how something is being built, well, it's the blueprint that ends the dispute. The blueprint is the final authority on the build, not the artist's interpretation, not the builder's interpretation, the blueprint. That is what becomes the authority. Now, as children of God, we have been given a blueprint. Come on, how many know what the blueprint is? Come on, how many know what the blueprint is? Somebody said it. If you have your blueprint, you can hold it up, shout it out loud. What is it? The Bible, the word of God. We've been given a blueprint to follow. This is a beautiful thing, and this is also extremely important for us as children of the Lord. This blueprint gives us the details. It gives us information. It gives us the design of what God has purposed for each one of our lives and how we are to build. In God's word, we find wisdom. We find guidance. We find our identity and our purpose. In God's wisdom, God's word, this becomes the rules of the house. See, as children of God, those of us that have put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have entered into a new family where we now have a heavenly father. Amen. And that's what makes you and I brothers and sisters. That's what makes us family. And I don't know about you, uh, but the, the house that I grew up in, had rules of the house. Anybody have rules of the house growing up? Uh, maybe that's not as popular nowadays. A couple of you are just like, yeah, I had rules of the house. All right, that's cool. All right, great. So um, uh, when I was growing up, I had a friend in junior high school, and I would hang out with him in junior high school and high school. And, and one day I was hanging out, and uh, my friend, he would call his parents by their first name. Right, some of you are like, oh. So if you didn't think you had rules of the house, you had rules of the house. <laughs> you, you had some silent rules that were never spoken, but you had some rules of the house. Well, me hanging out with this friend, I was like, this seems cool. Like, you know, I'm in high school now. I'm a freshman. I'm grown. Um, so I went home. And I called my mom by her first name. Two days later, when I woke up, uh, <laughs> that did not go well. <laughs> that was the first and last time. <laughs> we got some rules of the house. <laughs> There's a code of conduct that we live by. And for us as children of God, this is where we find it. This is the foundation that we build on. This is, it's going to be different than the house that you and I grew up with. It's going to be different than our experiences growing up because now we've entered into a new family and we have a heavenly father and he's given us the, the rules of conduct. He's given us the rules of his house. He's given us the rules for his family, all that we could be like him. And so there are some things that will fly, and there are some things that will not fly. <laughs> and so this is important. The Bible is our blueprint as we're building. As we're talking about building a godly legacy, it's important to start at the right place. This is not what you think is right, what I think is right, how we feel it should go. We go to the blueprint. We refer to the, the conduct, the rules of the house on how God has designed. Now, I like a good analogy, but analogies can only go so far. And so this one can only go so far too. There are a lot of similarities between the blueprint and how we could use God's word as a blueprint. And we're gonna talk about that in just a couple of moments. But this analogy is pretty, it's lacking. And I, I wanna expose how. See, a construction blueprint, well, a construction blueprint can be revised. 
Somebody could change their mind. I don't want the sunroom on this side. I now want the sunroom on this side. And new blueprints are drawn up. Well, God's word is perfect. It's eternal. It is in no need of revision ever. It doesn't matter the climate. It doesn't matter the year. It doesn't matter the culture. It doesn't matter the shifting trends of the world that we live in. This remains the same. The rules that God has established for the house are not subject to change. It is constant. It is a firm foundation. When the world says something is good, but the Bible calls it evil, then as God's children, we call it evil. We don't call it good. If all of a sudden they say, this is okay to do, but the Bible says, no, it's not, then as children of God, we say, no, it's not. Because guess what? This is eternal and this doesn't change. It is not subject to revision like a construction blueprint. Number two, for a construction blueprint, it'll show all the details and the end outcome of whatever that design build is. Well, the word of God gives us instruction for living, but each one of us didn't get a personalized printout of exactly how our life will turn out. You know, the house that we're gonna live in, the car that we're gonna drive, uh, who our kids are gonna be if we have kids, how old we're gonna live. It does not provide in detail those details for life. But what it does provide is the ultimate picture of what the end is, and that is glory to God. What it does provide is instructions to help us navigate through this world to the world that, we are, that we'll live in with Christ, our Lord, of this eternity that we're living for. We're not called to live for this world or earthly things, but we're called to lift our eyes, set our minds on things above and live for eternity, live towards eternity. And so this blueprint gives us those instructions to get to our final destination, which is heaven and eternity with God. So we need to, we need to refer to the blueprint my brothers and my sisters, we live in dark days. It's not good enough to just have a casual relationship with the word of God. It's not good enough to have it in our possession, to make a collection of it and let it sit on a shelf somewhere and check it out every so often. This needs to be part of our life. Like a blueprint, we need to refer to it daily. It needs to be part of our lives. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, his spiritual son, and he gives him, he gives him this talk about the last days. And he writes this in verses 1 through 5, 2 Timothy chapter 3. It says this, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Anybody say amen? For people will be lovers of self. Selfie. Lovers of money. Proud. Arrogant. Abusive. Disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful. Unholy. Heartless unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. It feels like the Apostle Paul could have written this last week. It feels like this is such an accurate description of the social climate that we are presently living in. There are voices that are vying for our attention. There are voices that are trying to define, redefine what God has already defined. 
This is the importance of why we need the blueprint, why the blueprint needs to be something that we refer to daily. This is where we find our wisdom. The world has its wisdom, but as children of God, we go towards the wisdom of the Bible. The world is trying to create an identity and tell us who we are, but God has already given us an identity. We have a God-given identity. As children of God, it's already been defined. There's no more search. God has called us his own. But the world is constantly trying to change the identity. The world has its own set of morality, but God has created the blueprint, the instruction for us as children of God. This is what we follow. It's not popularity. It's not trends. It is the truth of God's word. And now more than ever, we need God's word to be an anchor in our family. Family has different pieces. All of you here, you are family. You are part of God's family. You are my brother. You're my sister. This is not distinct to the season of life that you're in. In a family, you have young, you have older in this family, whatever season you're in, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're married and you have kids, whether you're grandparents, this is still the blueprint for every season of life. It doesn't stop. It's not limited to. This is still the anchor for every season of life. Paul writes those words to Timothy and it looks like a bleak report, but he doesn't write that with giving up hope. No, just a couple of verses later, Paul writes in, in verses 16 and 17 of the same chapter. He says, but all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. It's the word of God that enables us to navigate through any climate, no matter how hostile, through any culture, no matter how things change. Let the world try to redefine what God has already defined. As children of God, we stand on the side of the word of God and we say, no, God's word is true and God's word is eternal. Amen? So some practical ways that we can apply God's word as a blueprint for us in each of our lives. And so here it is. Number one, refer to it every day. Refer to it every day, every day. Last week, Pastor Jason read from Deuteronomy chapter six, verses four through seven. And you don't have to put it on the screen. We're gonna keep this list over here, but I want you to listen to this because this gives us the rhythm, and listen to what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. This group of verses, it, it's giving us the rhythm of life. Number one is refer to it every day. Allow the word of God to be a part of your coming and going. Let it be around the dinner table. Let it be in the house. For some of you, if a Bible verse comes out of your mouth, somebody's going to fall off their chair. Like, what's going on? <laughs> we don't want it to be unusual. Not for us. Not for God's people. God's word should be common out of our mouth, should be common in our household. It shouldn't be unusual. Number two, be intentional. Be intentional, intentional. Use God's blueprint. We wanna to refer to it every day and we want to be intentional. Don't just flip through the Bible and be like, all right, God, what do you have for me today? That's not gonna end well. <laughs> No, nah, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. When I was really young, that's how I used to approach the Bible. It's just like, okay, God, 
what do you want to do? You're not going to get much nourishment from random feedings. You want a systematic approach. You want a reading plan, get a devotional, get a journal. Systematically approach the word of God in your rhythm. Go through it. Chew on it. And it's not a race. It's not a race. Some of the greatest, most fruitful seasons for me in God's word was staying within the same chapter because God kept speaking and kept speaking. And there was more that he was doing in my heart through his word. It's not a race. Take your time. If it's a verse, it's a verse. If you're like, you know, in the advanced class, then it's a chapter. All right, great, great. But allow God's word to be in the rhythm of your everyday life. Number three, value it. Be passionate about it. As we speak, hundreds, if not thousands of people are gathered together dressed as comic book characters and movie characters in Comic-Con. I mean, C2E2 or whatever you want to call it. (laughs) You don't need to know their name to know what they're passionate about. You could just look at them and be like, okay, you like Star Wars. All right, I get it. (laughs) That's what passion does. That's what passion does. When you're passionate about something, it just comes out. It comes out in your mannerisms. It comes out in how you dress. It comes out in what you do. It comes out in what you talk about. Let that be the word of God in our lives. That we would value it. That we would be passionate about it. That it would just come out and be a part of our reputation of who we are as people. Somebody might not know your name, but they could be like, no, there's something different about him. There's something different about her. Let's be passionate about the word of God. And number four, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's not keep it to ourselves. I've been the recipient of some of you who have sent me a text message. Hey, I just want to encourage you. Hey, I want to send you a verse. An email. Oh man, I read this devotional. It encouraged me. I want to pass this to you. When we get encouraged by God's word, don't keep it to yourself. Share it. Some of you are so good at this. Do it. Continue to do it. What happens when all of us do this? When we read a scripture and it encourages our heart and we send it to a family member. Text it. Talk about it. Email it. But don't keep the word of God to yourself. Let it be part of who we are as children of God, in our homes, with our children, in our families, that the word of God would be heard often, spoke about often, and valued above all things. Let the word of God become a central part of your lives and your families and the rhythms that we have. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Amen? Everybody good? Ready for point number two? All right, point number two. Get the right materials. Get the right materials. Number one was follow the blueprint. Number two, get the right materials. First Peter chapter four, verse eight says this. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Men. Well, we have our blueprint, but we need the right materials. In order to build a healthy family, a godly legacy, we need the materials from God's list. They all need to be present and accounted for. This is not the time where we uh, start to cut corners or get some lesser quality of these materials. No, we want the genuine article. We want the real deal. Now, throughout the New Testament, we get a bunch of lists and instructions on how to live. In Ephesians 4, you can find several places uh, that uh, encourage us. We're commanded to put off the old self, which is corrupted by deceitful desires, and put on the new self, which is created in God for true righteousness and holiness. 
Also in Ephesians 4, we're commanded to speak truthfully and in anger not to sin and to be kind and compassionate to one another. But possibly the most famous list that we find in the New Testament is found in Galatians 5, verses 22 to 23, which is the list of the fruit of the Spirit. And this is what it is. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Okay, pop quiz. Oh, now some of you woke up. Pop quiz. You didn't have to study for it. It's okay. So we are grading this quiz. It's going to be a one-question quiz. And we're grading it on a very, very steep curve. So the chances of anybody not passing is very remote. All right? We've taken into consideration the fact that nobody here is perfect. If you are perfect, please raise your hand. I would love to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> but that nobody here is perfect, that all of us are growing, and that all of us have room for improvement. Everybody like those? Parameters? All right, that's great. Here it is. Based on the list of the fruit of the Holy Spirit at work in our life, we have kindness. How many people here would consider themselves a kind person? Raise your hand by show of hands. Okay, I will say that this is more than the 9 a.m. that raise their hands. But like the 9 a.m., I'm just going to have to move my wallet to a different pocket. <laughs> All right, for those of you that raise your hands, that consider yourself a kind person, not a trick question, if you brought your kindness with you, can you hold it up and show everybody? Okay, we got one person in the back that's lifting up the Bible. That's a good answer. But here's the thing. That list, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. Those are all intangibles. We, we, we can't see it. We can't lift it up. This work, these materials, this is an internal work that the Holy Spirit is doing in us. It would be amazing if we could translate the fruit of the Spirit to the cloud and get a notification, hey, your storage is low right? Hey, you're low on patience. Hey, you're low on joy. Hey, you're low on peace. That would be really amazing if there was some physical representation of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. That would be so great, right? We'd probably be buying each other gift cards. Hey, fill up on patience on me, you know? <laughs> How great would that be? <laughs> but it doesn't work that way. This is an internal work, and it's of the Holy Spirit. And, and we can't see it immediately. There needs to be a devotion to what it is. Out of all of the lists of the Holy Spirit, we're going to spend some time on just one, which is love. This key ingredient for building a godly legacy, love. 1 Corinthians 13 gives us that list of what love is and what love isn't. Love is patient, love is kind, right? It's not easily angered, it, it keeps no record of wrong, it's not self-seeking. And then it goes on in that chapter to talk about things that will come to an end, but these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the, the greatest of these is love, is love. The Bible talks about love and you can't escape it. This love is strong. The Bible says that love never fails. And I believe that. And this love that it's talking about is not your run-of-the-mill love. It's not your hallmark love or love that you find in the movies. This is not a sentimental love. No, this love is strong. This is, in Hebrew, what they call hesed. Love. And in Greek, which you might be more familiar with, is agape, love. This is a love that sticks around. This is a love that's not based on feelings. 
This is a love that's sacrificial. This is a love without condition. This love doesn't waver in its commitment. It's a love that doesn't break relationship. Cancel culture does not affect this type of love. This is a love that works through difficulty and gets stronger through adversity. This is the love that the Bible speaks about. And unfortunately, most of us have experienced the love of this world, which the love of this world is conditional. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. Oh, you're not holding up your end of the bargain? Well, bye. <laughs> it's contractual. It's based on conditions. But as part of God's family, part of the rules of the house, the material love is not just a common love. It's a strong love. It's a hesed love an agape love. In the book, Rare Leadership by Jim Wilder, he tells the story of when he was a young man working at a summer camp. And uh, this camp hosted a group of seniors for a week. And so the, he begins to talk about his experience with a couple of campers that he encountered during this session. And I want to give you this story that that he shares in his book. One camper was an older lady, and this older lady caught his attention during mealtime, during the first mealtime. Now, the practice of this camp was to create two lines for mealtime. One line uh, for people who needed assistance, and the other line for everybody else. And when the first mealtime came, this lady came from the back and rushed and made, made her way through the line, pushing over some people with walkers and started pushing on the door. And Jim, the author, he started reprimanding her. Excuse me, miss, miss, it's not time yet. What are you doing? And the lady proceeded to ignore him as if he wasn't even there. The second the staff opened the doors to start the mealtime, she pushed her way in, grabbed the food, and started eating before anybody else even got to the food. Now this happened every single mealtime. They saw her making a beeline all the way through, and they couldn't stop her. The only way that they could manage the whole situation was creating a human shield around the walker brigade so that she doesn't push them over. On top of this, to make matters worse, she smelled really bad. Like you could smell her from a distance. Several days into the camp and a couple of hot, sweaty days, this just made matters worse. And so a couple of the female counselors, they decided to grab a hold of her, drag her into the showers, and resolve the issue. Kicking and screaming, she went. You could hear it throughout the camp. But at the end, the campers were happy, and the staff was happy, and there was a victory won. This other camper that Jim encountered during this session was almost the complete opposite. He was an older man, very poised, very dapper, very clean, and highly educated. He writes that he knew more than 17 languages and that they were talking some really great conversations. And he recalls one night having a conversation with this, with this older gentleman on the bench talking about uh, Hungarian and how Hungarian is different from other languages, right? And what a great conversation that is. And then the woman walks by. The woman. And she passed on by as they're having the conversation. And the first thing that Jim thought to himself is, well, I don't smell her. Well, that's, that's a win. And he stops the conversation with the older man and he begins to, tell, begins to tell him, like, she has been so difficult. She's been wreaking havoc this whole week in the camp, she's been super disruptive. Like, man, she's given all of us, the, this, the, the staff, such a hard time. And the man was like, that's my wife. <sighs> Awkward. <laughs> Other than feeling embarrassed in that moment for complaining about his wife, 
it's almost like, wait, what? The man stops. He holds out his arm, his left arm. And he points to a long string of numbers tattooed on the inside of his arm. And it begins to explain. We were held in concentration camps. We were separated. And we were married. I never thought I would see her again. We were separated for years. She was a concert pianist. She toured Europe. She was beautiful, talented, caring. She would fill music halls. He was like, after the war, I didn't think I'd find her, but I found her. And it's been 30 years, and there's been no change. While she was held in camp, they were cutting out pieces of her brain, one by one, without anesthesia. And he started to say, people tell me, you should just put her in a home. He's like, I can't because I remember who she was, and I love her. This is a chesed type of love, and this gives a picture of how God loved us. Stiff-necked, rebellious, sinful, and yet God loved us. But God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. For us, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then God says, the way that I love you is the way that I want you to love others. This is not a flippant love. We can't cut corners. We can't be like, yeah, I love them, but I can't, I don't want to be in the same room. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to see them. Uh, that's not, that doesn't describe this love. We need the real deal. We need the genuine article. This is what's on the blueprint. A love that's strong. A love that doesn't break away. A love that's patient, a love that's kind, a love that's not easily anger, a love that's not self-seeking, a love that keeps no record of wrong. It's all there. This is the quality of love that we need to love with. It's all there for us. And this love, it goes hand in hand with forgiveness. And this is difficult. None of us. Not one of us could love like this in our own strength. This has to be the work of the Holy Spirit in us. It's internal. It's an internal work. This leads to forgiveness because love makes forgiveness possible. Forgiveness is choosing to no longer hold an offense a debt against someone. Martin Luther King Jr. is quoted saying this, forgiveness does not mean ignoring what has been done or putting a false label on an evil act. It means rather that the evil act no longer remains as a barrier to the relationship. Forgiveness is a catalyst creating the atmosphere necessary for a fresh start and a new beginning. This love remains relational. It remains connected even when it gets hard. This type of love leads to this type of forgiveness. Great love leads to great forgiveness. And this is what's on the blueprint for us as children of God. 
Sometimes it's easier to forgive others than it is to forgive family. But God knows exactly what he's doing. Because if we could break through and exhibit this type of love to the people that are closest to us, then how much more can we give that same type of love to people that are outside of our family? It serves as a witness to the watching world that this type of love has power over pain. This type of love chooses not to be offended. This type of love chooses to remain even in difficulty. This type of love chooses to extend grace towards others' brokenness, the same grace that we need for ours. This type of love, this great love, leads to great forgiveness. And this is for everybody. If you're single and you're not married yet, don't wait till you get into a relationship to start building this type of love. Don't wait until you have a family. Don't wait till you get older. You don't have to wait for any other season. In every season is the right time to follow the blueprint, to get the right materials, and to activate this type of love and forgiveness. Today could be the day. If you're feeling it, if that's, if that's hitting a wall for you, if a, if a bunch of people just came into your mind, if you're starting to argue with yourself, because you, you're not arguing with me, <laughs> if you're starting to argue with yourself, well, you don't know what they did and you don't know what they said, if, if that's the conversation that's happening right now, then this is for you. And you have a great opportunity to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to work these things in your heart in your mind, and to bring healing and restoration to your relationships. It could be a renovation of your heart, and changes can begin today. Amen. Good? You got one more point in you? Like, could we? All right, cool. Point number three. Point number three. Build an identity of honor. Build an identity of honor. Ephesians 6, verse 2. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Ephesians. Well, we are full circle we are back where we began all of two weeks ago, Ephesians 6. We're going to be taking the rest of our time talking about honor. Now, if you're like me, uh, when I think of the word honor, I automatically went towards terms of merit and accomplishment, right? To show honor to. I, I think of a soldier coming back from war, being awarded the Medal of Honor. I, I think of statues. I think of street corners and buildings named after people who did some great things or accomplished some great feat. I think of a fast food joint with an employee of the month placard all on the wall, usually the same person because they only got three employees. <laughs> it's an honor. <laughs> you get a picture on the wall. That's great. Or if you eat a burger fast enough, depending on where you go, you'll get a picture on the wall. I think of offices that will have a special lunch, that'll give a special award, a special acknowledgement. These are all great ways to honor. I love it. These are good. These are right. These are wonderful ways to honor and show appreciation and acknowledgement for the people in our lives and the things that they've done. But the honor that's being talked about here 
in Ephesians 6 that the Apostle Paul is writing about is different. This honor is not connected to merit or accomplishments. The Bible is commanding us to show honor to father and mother based on their position. Simply because they're your father and mother, you are to show honor. The Apostle Paul here in Ephesians is quoting Exodus 20.12, where God has given the Ten Commandments to Moses, and honor your father and mother is commandment number five. Paul takes this command that was given to Israel, and he applies it as instruction to all the believers on how families should continue to build. By God establishing honor to parents as part of the commandments to Israel in the Old Testament, this becomes one of the marks that sets Israel apart from other nations because they are building relationship differently than how the world does. They're commanded to build relationship through love and care and not status and usefulness. Because in the world, if you don't have status and you're not useful, you get forgotten. But not in God's family. He establishes honor as a way to guarantee continued care and love and to build relationship throughout our lifetime. This is the way in God's kingdom. And this is out of reverence and honor to God. And this is where we find the footing to give honor to our parents. It's love through the work of the Holy Spirit that enables us to show up and stay relational even when relationship may be broken. It's honor to parents that plays a huge role in building a godly legacy. I remember as a young adult, already married, have a family of my own, that my mom began to care for her mom, my grandmother, in her later years. And this took a lot of work. This was showing up. This was making sure things around the house were taken care of. My grandmother wasn't as mobile or as independent as she used to be, even though in her mind she was as young as 23. And she always felt that. Uh, but she wasn't jumping rope anymore. <laughs> Grandma was moving a little bit slower as she got older, and that's what happens to all of us. But my mom starts taking care of her mom. And this was years of a process, and it was not a cakewalk. It was not easy. It was hard. And at times it was very painful. Hurtful words were exchanged. And they would get into an argument where my grandmother wanted to be independent and my mom was just trying to help her. She would push away. No matter how bad it got, my mom would show up the next day as if yesterday didn't even happen because she knew that my grandmother needed the care and she was showing honor to her. Most of all, she was showing honor to the Lord because she would come home, she'd pray, Lord, please help me. I'm trying to do this for you. I remember as a young man, my father taking care of his father in his last years and spending nights over at his house and making sure the groceries were taken care of and making his farina the right way, just the way he likes it. And And my parents set an example to me and my siblings. So you know what? We couldn't just sit by and see mom and dad get involved and, and not get involved. So me and my brothers and my sister, we got involved. And then it wasn't just us, my uncles, my aunts, my cousins. This was a family effort. And we all took turns. 
and we all interrupted our schedules and we were all inconvenienced and we all sacrificed and we took care of my grandfather and we took care of my grandmother. We took care of our family. Now, don't get it twisted. We're messed up. <laughs> we are broken. <laughs> we, we don't do this perfectly. This is all glory to God. Because here's what I realize. Now that I'm older, I recognize something. I think back to those times and I recognize that my parents and my aunts and my uncles, they were using the same blueprint. <laughs> they were using the blueprint. They were using the materials. They weren't perfect people. None of us are perfect, but they were using the blueprint. And that set an example for me and my siblings. So now me and my wife, as we're raising our family, guess what? We're using the blueprint. And, and, and we're using the materials. Yeah, yeah. And guess what our prayer is? That I, when our kids get older, that they would use the blueprint. And that they would use the same materials. And, and that their children and their children's children, and for however many generations the Lord would allow, that they would use the blueprint my parents didn't know it. I didn't realize it at the time. But a godly legacy was being built. You don't see it at the time. Remember, this is intangible. But God gives us the key. He gives us a little insight. He says, be faithful. Because we all want to hear it, right? Well done, good and faithful. We may not get it perfect, but we at least want to be faithful. And as we're faithful, it serves as an example to the next generation. And we pray that that generation passes it to the next generation and a godly legacy is built. That's the prayer for my family. But that's also the prayer I have for you and your family. Maybe you didn't grow up in a Christian home. Maybe you came to faith later on in life. Maybe you're the first in your family to be saved. Maybe you're the third and fourth generation saved in your family. Maybe you grew up with a troubled household. Maybe, maybe you and your parents are not on good terms right now. Today can begin a brand new godly cycle in your family, in your life that could move towards future generations of a godly legacy. This footing, honor your father and your mother. The footing that God gives us is not based on our father and mother's merit. Maybe you didn't have a great dad. Maybe you didn't have a great mom. Maybe there's a lot of brokenness there but we're not honoring them because of their accomplishments or their merits. What we're saying is this, God, because you said to honor, I'm gonna honor. It's directly connected to our relationship with the Lord. Whenever I hear that, I think of the account of Peter when he was fishing all night and Jesus was on the shore, right? And Jesus calls out, hey, did you catch any fish? <laughs> Peter's like, no. Well, throw the net on the other side. Really? On the other side of the boat? Fisherman? Carpenter. But Peter says something key. He says, because you said it, Lord, I'm going to do it. And he throws the net on the other side and they get this huge catch. They can't even bring it in themselves. They have to call for help. This thing of honoring father and mother, this is less about what they have done and whether they quote unquote deserve it. This is out of our honor and obedience to the Lord. Lord, because you said it, I'm going to honor. Even if this is hard, I'm not trying to sell you a Disney ending where this is like, hey, if you do these three things, then everything's going to be wonderful. No, 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 no. It might not work out. But you can know that you are honoring the Lord 
It might not repair the, the relationship on this side of heaven, but you're not doing it because of the outcome. You're doing it because of obedience. God, because you said so, that's what I will do. And parents, we are setting a godly example of obedience to the watching generation that's coming up after us. If you don't have kids, you can still leave a legacy. Leave the legacy of obeying the Lord, even in the hard things. I want to leave you with these words. These are the words of Romans chapter 12, verse 9 through 10. And it says this. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the blueprint that gives us a path to healthy relationships, godly legacy. I pray that we would become people that are marked and known by our love, forgiveness, and honor for one another, and that it would bring you much glory. I pray that you would stir our hearts to follow after all that your word commands us, even the hard things. Holy Spirit, I pray for breakthrough, healing, and reconciliation of broken relationships. And I pray for a great sense of wholeness as we choose to build our lives according to your word. I pray this for everyone here in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen.